I would like you to talk a little bit about your life before coming into Suwood. Okay. Um, well, I was born in California in 1976, and my uh, parents were fresh out of college. My dad was, uh, I think my dad was 24 and my mom was 20, and they'd been married for two years, and I was the oldest. And um, they had five kids. I'm the oldest of five kids. And the first five years of my life, they were involved in a uh, Christian charismatic Christian church that became very culty, uh, where the power structure began to become more and more tight and collapse around the will of one man. And, uh, then when I was five or six, my parents took themselves out of that and kind of went on a diaspora. Um, and we moved around a whole lot while they were kind of trying to put their, uh, lives back together and kind of put things back together. Um, for themselves and, and for our family. My dad had always wanted to be a pastor. Um, he felt a deep calling um, since he was a teenager uh, to um, serve uh, God in the capacity of shepherd or reverend. And uh, he kept on trying to do that, um, but it didn't really pan out. And then when I was in high school, uh, well, in seventh or eighth grade, we finally found a church where uh, all of us kids felt um, at home there. And my parents uh, found a home there and a community there. And that was with the uh, Covenant, uh, the Evangelical Covenant denomination, which is a descendant of the Swedish Lutheran Covenant denomination. And when I was 17, my dad decided to go to seminary and through that denomination, begin his career as a pastor. Before that, he'd just been a truck driver um, growing up. And so they left me behind in California for my senior year of high school and uh, went to Chicago. Uh, we were in Sacramento, outside of Sacramento in Rockland, California. They went to Chicago. I finished up high school, and then I went up to a Bible college uh, in Canada, in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, very far north up there in Canada. And I, that was a one year, very small Bible college. And then after that, in 1995, I guess it would be, I landed in Chicago and uh, lived with my parents for a year. And then they moved uh, back to California where my dad got a pastorship uh, at a church in Fresno. And then I kind of spent some wild years uh, in Chicago, uh, experimenting, wrestling, um, playing around, experimenting, all that stuff. Um, and my own path towards Subud, should I just keep on going? Is this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this background. So I had always, when I was 10, uh, or 11, I went to a Bible camp where my parents actually, that was held where my parents met at Bethany Bible college. in I think the Bay area, um, of California. And at that, um, Bible camp one night, there was a worship service and I was overcome with a very profound, um, experience or sensation of the love of God. And it really shook me. Um, I was just overwhelmed by the greatness of God. And, uh, I guess I kind of just started speaking in tongues or something. I started just spontaneously expressing, uh, this communion, uh, with the spirit. Um, and so for me, God was always a reality. Uh, it was never a question whether God or not God existed or not. Um, but as I grew into like 18, 19, I became very frustrated uh, with uh, the church. And I got really uh, angry uh, at my dad and at the church for talking about God, but not really delivering on the promise of, of that. I felt like it was just this hollow uh, formality that people went through um, because they had just always gone through that. It was just this habit. And I really uh, disliked the absence of presence that I felt. And yet at the same time, I didn't really go seeking for that 
through other spiritual, well, through other um, spiritual practices or other uh, churches. I did a lot of reading because I was seeking, but because of that experience in my formative years of that cult, I was very like, I didn't want to, you know, I, I had a really big distrust of authority but a really deep longing for direct connection. And I utilized various synthetic means and other kinds of practices to achieve that. And in, in 1998, I was kind of at the end of my rope. I had kind of pushed myself so far that I was starting to have uh, like kind of these mental breakdowns where I, I wasn't able to control myself. My emotions would get out of control and I wasn't living a, a, a stable life. Um, and I got to a point where I knew that there was two paths that I could go down to. I could give myself to God wholly, or I could give myself to myself wholly. Uh, and there was just, there was just these two paths. And I kind of made one night, I kind of made a pact. I'm like, God, you need to show me, uh, which way to go. Cause I'm going to just commit either way, my will or your will. All right. And very shortly after that, I met a young woman. Uh, I was working at Starbucks downtown Chicago at that time in the Gold Coast district, so north of downtown. And I met this girl on my uh, cigarette break, and she was uh, she came up to me. I was reading Nietzsche, and she started this conversation, and she wanted to go out to dinner. So we I went out to dinner with her, and we started just talking all the time, and we were just kind of connected really strongly, and. She would do this really funny, weird thing where she wanted me to feel energy. So she'd put her hands up to me, to mine, and, and say, raise your hands, uh, but don't touch me. Don't just try to try to feel that. Don't touch me. Um, just feel the energy. Feel the energy. Feel the energy. She's a really, really weird um, young woman. And uh, one night we were at her apartment, and we started to do that again. And I felt uh, this huge uh, stream of warmth break open from my inside and go throughout my whole body. And I just started to, to felt this, I guess it was like a vibration, but the quality of warmth and comfort uh, and power um, was all wrapped up into that. And I'm like, where did you find this? And she's like, well, I, I've always just felt this. Um, I, she had been in a car accident when she was younger and her dad died and she was in a coma for a while. When she woke up at that, she would have these intrusions of this energy into her consciousness. And I'm like, well, I want more of that. She's like, well, you can't, you can't just force it and you, you should really relax and, and stop doing it, but I wouldn't let it go. So through the whole night, I was just like laying on her floor, vibrating. And I woke up and I, I was late to work and I ran around the corner to my job and I got on and I just felt everything was clear and clean and I just felt so light and, and, uh, I guess, un, unanchored, um, to, to the heaviness, heaviness and all that anger and rage and seeking that I was, I was, I was just free for a minute. And this woman came up to my, I remember it that morning, this woman came up to me uh, to get her coffee. And I was just, I, I just was communicating with her and she's like, I want whatever you're having. Uh, right. And I'm like, well, okay, fine here. And I just kind of opened myself to her and it went from me into her and her whole face like changed. And as she got her coffee and she kind of just w drifted out the door. And then th th like a week later, uh, Evelyn, um, Emmeline, her name was Emmeline. Um, she found a advertisement in the weekly free paper called the Chicago reader. I don't think it's around anymore. I don't know. Um, but it turns out that there was a new guy in Subud, Chicago and he had gotten open and then right away went on to be the chair of Subud Chicago, like people do. And he wanted to advertise Subud and everybody else said, no, you can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. You can't do that. And, and he just said, I'm going to do it anyways. And he didn't even say it. He just put an ad in the paper. I never saw this ad. It was just a little two line thing about like non-denominational, non-dogmatic spiritual experience that's free for all. And, uh, no strings attached. And Evelyn uh, or Emmeline said, this is, 
she she brought this to me she's like we have to do this this is this is why we're together you have to we have to meet these people so we set up an appointment and met with nicholas and uh victor and sylvia now shoshana margolin and um i can't remember nicholas's uh last name he's my age i Harper. Uh, he's now Harper. in i no. He, he's my age i don't think it's harper i can't remember he's now in uh, la um but i don't think he's been in uh, active in subud for a while um and we met them at some applebee's and i was really frustrated with the guys because they were trying to talk and or not talk and i'm like what are you guys even talking about like what are you even talking about? And, um, but I looked at Shoshana's face and I'm like, there's something she's onto something like it's reflected. She's, she's reflecting that, which is good. And so there's some sort of truth here. And so they set up a uh, time for us to go and sit outside of the Lottie Hahn hall up in Evanston. Um, they were, they had been renting churches, um, to do Lottie Hahn at, and, uh, I skipped that first night, um, that we were supposed to go up there on a Thursday. I'm like, I got home. I'm like, I don't know. This is, it, it just doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. And then afterwards, uh, Emmeline called me. This is back in the days where we had landlines. She called me up and she reamed me out. She just yelled at me. She's like, why the, you know, you, you're a stupid idiot. Why, why are you not going through on this? You're a total coward to not go, go through this. And I, I'm like, hey, you're just being silly, but fine, fine. I'll go. And so the next Tuesday or Thursday or Monday, I went up to the church they were at and um, I kind of, you know, it was late or it was dark. And I think this was, this must have been July, 1998. And I went, I found where they were meeting. I sat outside, people like shuffled in. They said hi to me. I'm like, yeah, I'm here to, you know, talk about this thing and uh they went into the room and i just kind of sat there and i took out my book and i was drawing or i was reading and i heard silence and then a mumbling and then singing and stomping and the the lottie hunt i heard the the, the men's lottie hunt and right away i couldn't i couldn't read what was in my hands and i just started to feel this huge swelling inside of me and I'm like, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I ran to a closet. I ran into a closet and I started to bawl and cry and cry and cry and cry and cried for the whole lot I just bawled my eyes out. And then they got quiet. I'm like, crap, what's going on? So I like, I, I cleaned up myself and went back and sat down, pretended like nothing happened. And then uh, they had me in, they came in and there was this other guy, this other applicant, um, that his first night and he's like, what are you guys talking about? I heard from my wife or, or a friend of my wife's about this thing. So what is this thing? And the, the helpers or the, the men, the stupid men started talking about the Lottie Han. And I got really mad at him. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you guys are sitting on. You have no idea the depth. I was so mad at them. <laughs> and I was such a jerk. I was such a jerk. So I spent like an hour arguing with these guys about this thing that I had never, you know, I, I just came off the street. And uh, and that commenced like this painstaking four or five month applicant period where I'd come to Lottie Han. I do Lottie Han outside the Lottie Han Hall. Then we'd come in and they're like, do you have any questions? Like, I have no questions. Like, there's nothing that you could tell me that there's nothing you could tell me when do I get to go in and I was still I was not um out, outside of that my life was getting more and more dramatic and more and more intense and I was having uh, really intense things going on in in my psyche and in my life and I was not stable and so I think that's part of the reason why they delayed opening me so that was through july and then i i kind of dropped off the map and then in september i came back to chicago and i'm like you know i really i should really do this thing this this stupid thing is really important i i should do this i need this so i contacted them again and uh we we started to meet again i think it was a little bit more calm and then they finally gave me a date they're like, okay, we're going to open you. I think it was like October 17th, 1998. And the, a few days before them. So I was going to be open on, on Thursday, but I was going to do one more Monday night meeting with them. 
but I couldn't because I was uh, work went late or my shift uh, just didn't allow that to happen. So I, I was going home. I was walking home from the train. I got off the train station uh, at, the, at the end of the Brown Line in Chicago. Uh, Kimball, Kedzie, Kim, Kimball. Um, and I was walking this route that I always took and I had been, I had this route that I walked home where I'd go around Von Steuben high school because it was the only place in the, in the city that was just kind of quiet. And I go back there and just be quiet for a bit because my life was just so chaotic. And I, I, I started walking and the closer I got to that spot, the more and more agitated I, I became until I, I had to run. Like I just had to run there and I just started crying so hard. I was so like, I, I just, I started like getting opened. Right. And I was just like crying and crying and I cried there for half an hour. And then I went home and there was this girl at my apartment and I, I looked at her and then I started crying again. I just fell down on the couch, cried. And then there's this kitten that we had, uh, in my apartment, the kitten came over there and like laid on me, like trying to calm me down. It was really intense. And then I get a call from Horianto. Um, I can't remember his last name, a Vietnamese guy. I believe he passed away um, a few years ago. He called me up. He's like, you should, you, sh- you really need to come to, to Lodihan. This is a really important time for you. I'm like, dude, I know. <laughs> I know what's going on. And then I get opened that Thursday. And it's like, okay, it's, the, the opening had already happened. It's like, okay, finally, I'm, I'm just doing Lodihan. And so for the first year I did Lodihan, um, and, uh, it was just me just like, I was throwing up all the crap inside of me. Like I was just like, I'd get down on my knees and just purging all this stuff out for, for a while. And then I, I'll take a break. I just want to get to one key turn and then I'll stop. I, I kind of stopped doing Lottie on, uh, for some reason. And then for, for that next summer, and then something really dramatic that I'm not going to talk about happened to me. Like there was just my, a relationship that was important to me just blew up in my face and just totally wrecked me. It just totally destroyed me. And I went into absolute crisis mode. I was, I was in crisis for about a year and a half, but I, I, and by crisis, like I couldn't watch, I couldn't watch movies without feeling everything that the actors were doing. I, I was really, really sensitive and really raw and really, really weak. I had a, had a big, big ego and my ego was just broken and I was just, I was just shattered and I didn't know what to do. And, um, I, uh, Daniel, um, Chaffetz Magnuson, I think his name is, everybody's got three or four names. Magnus. Assume. Magnus. Uh, he gave me a ticket to go to Portland, um, for the national super national in 2000. Uh, I'm a helper now. I can't remember what it's called. Congress. Yeah. Um, I was going to say convention, but it's not a convention. It's a Congress. So I went out to Portland and I met a girl and, uh, I had a total, another total crisis where I'm like, my life is just broken. And I went back to Chicago. I flew back to Chicago and I was just miserable. I, and I cried for three or four days. Um, I was just crying constantly. I could barely function. And then I decided I'm going to move to Portland. There's this girl out in Portland. She'll help me figure out things on the ground. Um, and as soon as I made that decision, I was just at peace. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get out of, out of town. So I worked my butt off. I bought a train ticket and I landed in Portland at the end of August of 2000. And I lived with, um, Camille Hoffendahl. Um, uh, she was, she was, uh, she, she had this boarding house basically cause all her kids moved out. And then I just was in Portland and I kind of restarted my life, uh, from, the bottom up out here it's quite a story (laughs) that's my story yeah so how did you uh progress in portland how were you feeling better at that time um well i ended up working in a preschool um because daniel magnus chaffis and a couple other people have said that I'd be good with kids and I didn't know what else to do with my time. So I opened up the phone book and I looked up 
preschool. This is back when there's phone books and yellow pages. And in the yellow pages, I looked for a preschool um, that was close to me. And they didn't answer. So I looked at for another one close to me, and they picked up, and they hired me right away. Um, I mean, I went in, and I did the background check, and then I just worked with kids. And for and and when I started to work with children, so I was still very raw. I remember in Portland after a lot, I was doing Lottie Han every chance that I could get. That was my lifeline. I didn't know what else to do with myself. Just do Lottie Han and try to do this thing that I wanted to do, which is to be a writer. And, um, and after Lottie Han, the group was pretty active. So we always have tea and conversation. And I w- always had to put a pillow over my heart because my heart was just so raw. I was doing a lot of healing um, because my heart had been broken. Um, it was coming back together. But when I was working with the children, like I, it was really, um, how do I describe it? It was like, you know, the people, there's this really stupid phrase that has a grain of truth in it. Like those who know do, well, those who can do those who can't teach. And I didn't know how to be a human being <laughs> at that point in time. I kind of broke in my capacity to be a human being and working with the kids and starting from the very beginning of human beings and teaching those kids how to be a human being taught me how to be a human being. And that began my progress um, through the 20, uh, the 2000s, the early 2000s. Uh, I worked with kids a lot. I wrote a lot. I did a lot of Lottie Han. And uh, there was a pretty great group in Portland at that time. There was several people my age when I landed. Um, and little by little, all the people my age basically have moved away from Portland. I mean, I moved away from Portland in 2010. Um, so it's now there's just kind of a boomer set that's holding the fire. There's not a lot of people my generation. I'm Gen X. Um, yeah. So how was your first Manuka? Oh, yeah. Okay. So every year there was a, uh, a retreat for the Pacific Northwest region, a Kejiwan event, which would be spiritually centered. And they held it at this uh, little chateau called Manuka by the running waters or something like that. And all these people would go up there and sit in a circle and talk for a couple hours and then do Lottie Han and talk and cook and hang out. And I landed there and I kind of, I, I landed in Portland and, and a couple months later, September, October is usually the second I think it's always this had it always been the second week of November. I went there and that was a really profound experience because everybody kind of, it was really active at that point. A lot of people came up from California and there was a pretty big bandwidth of age and a lot of people have died and a lot of people have kind of left Subud, but it was pretty active, um, especially my first year. And uh, I can't really remember much about it other than, uh, feeling at home. And so I could tell a story that can illustrate my life in Subud a little bit with, um, by comparing it to my relationship with my father because, and my, my parents, because when I found Subud and I knew that it was the, the real thing, um, I tried to communicate that to my parents and my parents were automatically very, very wary of it because there's all this new, it was all the hallmarks of a cult, all these new weird terms, you know, and this, you know, all these forces and, you know, these levels and this weird language. It's just, that's what a cult does. It has all these different, it has a worldview that's kind of esoteric in a way, um, and no, and, and you'd look at the website and even when I tell people about it, I, which I don't too much, um, which is another, uh, conversation, um, they, they go, they look on the website. They're like, well, what are you really talking about? Like, what, what is this thing you're talking about? And I was trying to communicate to my father that this is the real thing. This is the real thing. This is the real thing. And he was not having it. And we had a really, we had a couple of years where we were just fighting uh, and, and wrestling with each other a lot. And I was really headstrong. And I think he was being pretty headstrong too. And we had a really difficult time anyways, because um, his psychology, it, it, it's really difficult for him to communicate, even though he's a pastor. Um, but there was a big gap in, in my closeness to my father. And I, and the one thing that we both had in common was this very deep love of God. And we couldn't meet that. We couldn't meet 
at all because it was Jesus or hell, right, for him. And I couldn't communicate that. But eventually I let it go. I'm like, this. It, there's no way that I can communicate this to somebody who's not open to it. Um, so it, I just have to do it and leave uh, not – try not to prove anything to my dad. And so over the course of my maturation, aided by Subud, but I think it was just a natural course of, uh, of uh, maturation, I, I relaxed, my dad relaxed, and I think that my life got better um, due in part to Subud and, you know, uh, the gift of the Lodihan in me just kind of allowed me to relax probably quicker than I would have and especially a lot easier than had I taken that other path back in 1998 where I concentrated on my will. And that, that, that kind of that wager that I made with God, like either my will or your will, um, he, God said, my will, my will is good. Um, I'm like, okay, well, I'll do your will. And he totally broke my will. My will was completely smashed, right? Um, and, then, and then I went through a period, that was a difficult period, and then I had another relationship fail in the like 2007 and i i got i went through another period of ego death again and uh and i think that that's just kind of my life is that i go through these periods of flourishing and then being broken and then being lost and then coming back online and um the laudion's always there um even even when i go through really difficult times it, it's still there um but i still have to go through this process How did you come to become a helper in Subud? Oh, the helper. Oh, my gosh. Without naming any names, that was a contentious issue. Um, I think I, I wanted to be a helper because I was just, I really wanted to facilitate Subud. And there was really no one my age in Portland at that time. And another helper really didn't want me to be a, a helper at all. He really just, I don't know why. He just didn't want me to be a helper. And he was really hard on me for several years. He was very, very hard on me. And I had a lot of anger for him for a really long time. Um, and I wasn't the only one. <laughs> I had a lot of anger for this one individual who's softened and I've softened. But I did have a lot of anger issues and daddy issues. And I would project that onto the helpers um, by being very judgmental of them. And, uh, and you know, and then getting some of that back. And so um, most of the male helpers said, yeah, sure, let's let's get you being a helper. But one helper was adamant that I would not become a helper. It was not right for me to be a helper. And there was no like reason or rhyme about it. But eventually I just kind of became a helper. Um, and what did that really mean? I don't, I really don't know what it means, uh, other than just showing up and being present. Like that's really all it is. I mean, okay, no. Well, yeah. Um, so being a helper, I guess one thing you do is open people, but the main thing you do is this is, this is probably going to be a little controversial. Um, it, it, you're not, I guess Bapak said it really good. Like God is the teacher. Bapak just kind of cleans up the chalkboard and, and sets the chairs in order. And a helper, especially for Lodihan, if you attend to the Lodihan, you do Lodihan, but if you attend to the Lodihan and to the space, you become, I don't know how to say this without like flying in the face of what some people think Subud is. You participate in holding the space and, and a good helper. And you can feel this at different Congresses. If the helpers who are in charge of the Congress really put the time in to facilitate a really deep, quiet, um, focus on the Lodihan, then the Lodihan really can take off. And if they don't do that, if there's something amiss in the helpers who set it up, then the Lodihan can not even really be there. Like, it's like you, you like in Freiburg, it was this really weird experience where I would, which is the last national gathering or international gathering in 2018, the Lodihan wasn't there. It was so frustrating. I'd go to these huge Lodihans and I'm like, where's the Lodihan? I was looking 
I was just, I'd walk around like looking for the Lottie and it wasn't there. And then Ibu Rahayu, for some reason, decided that she needed to go. And she told everybody like, you need to, you need, I think she used the word juice. Like you need the juice. You need to be pursuing the juice and the juice isn't here. Like she kind of dressed everybody down in this weird way. And then after that talk where I fell asleep, of course, everybody fell asleep. Um, we went to Ladihan and the Ladihan still wasn't there. And I just got, I kind of got frustrated, not with God, but I'm like, I just like Ladihan start. Like I really made a very strong, um, declaration inside of myself to begin, like begin the Ladihan. And then I started to feel the Ladihan happen. And I think that a helper's role is to in the Ladihan to be really quiet and really just hold the space. And, and over the course of my helper work, being local and then regional a bunch of times and now national for a very difficult national term because of COVID and everything. Um, and difficult in just this weird, strange way. Um, as a helper, I don't know how to be a helper because I don't know how to like small talk with people. I'm not really good at like communicating with people or like being present with people, but I can be a vessel for the Lottie Hunt. And I feel that whenever I'm in a helper work, like some people say that you get the juice, right? But I feel like I, I feel space. And when I, when I was made national helper after Freiburg, like I felt like I felt this space come over me. Like, I'm like, wow, okay. I'm, I'm responsible for keeping this space wide and open. And so there's nothing you can really do. There's infinite amount of things that you can do wrong <laughs> as a helper, but there's really nothing you can do that's right because you don't do anything other than not do anything. Like it's like this absence of 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 doing anything. It's just trying to maintain responsibility over a space, over a spiritual space, and you're yeah. kind of in that position to do that. You're like a pillar, maybe, or, or a, you're, you're you're given the ability to be a, a supporting pillar for a certain period of time for the Lottie Han over a certain area. Right. Yeah. That's been my experience. So have you had any unusual experiences or experiences that had a major effect on your life after being in Subu for a while? Um, so when I, I was trying, I was talking to a couple of Catholic people. Uh, I, I was speaking with this young woman who wants to be a nun very recently. And, and I've been doing, uh, I've been working, somehow I got involved doing a YouTube channel and doing a lot of interviews. And so I cover a lot of different topics. And one of the topics that I really want to investigate and to interview is spirituality, but I've been really reticent of doing that because whenever you talk about religion or spirituality, people just start arguing, which is the exact opposite of what I want, of what, what spirituality is. Um, I was talking to this, this woman who really, she's just got such a beautiful light inside of her and she's so in love with God and just wants to dedicate herself to, to God. And, and I was trying to communicate. I'm like, you don't have to go away from the world to be with God. Like you can be with God all the time. Like that's, that's the, the lot, the gift of the Lottie Han is like that, that God is, can actually, you can be in constant prayer, which is what a lot of nuns and monks do. They are pursuing a life where every single breath is directed towards God. You're in constant prayer. And that's the same thing with Lottie Han. And what Bapak has talked about with, about the Lottie Han is that you can do that inside life. You used to have to retreat and quiet yourself. The gift of the Lottie Han is that it can be with you and you can just live a normal life and you can watch the relationship between the spiritual world and the outer world through not being religious, but working your ass off, like watching your relationship between work and, and, and your own development within a field. And I think it's really important. That's what I got last Ramadan. Uh, yeah. La last Ramadan last year, at the end of it, I got this understanding that I haven't really been able to put into words, but that, that my work in the world and my impact in the world is the proof of my spirituality and everything else is beyond me. Like the afterlife, 
um, my spiritual status, you know, my, my holiness, all of that stuff. I have no idea about It's None of my responsibility. The only thing that's responsible is putting myself in a position where the Lottie Han might come to existence in the world in a product. And my product is discussion right now. I, I do three or four interviews a week and I interview a lot of different people, but a lot of different things. People who are, I, I, I interview prostitutes, you know, I, I interview broken people of all sorts. I, I interview professionals of the highest tier in a variety of different domains. And I, I talk to just moms and dads about, you know, what it is to be a mom, what it is to be a father, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man. And my method, I don't know how I got to do this. I just saw that I was able to to listen in a way where people would open up and the technology would fall away and you'd get this opening up and this flowering of other people. And it's really directly related to my Lottie Han because I just, I just get quiet and then spontaneously an idea will come up or they'll say something and they start to speak into a certain quality of listening. It's very special. And I think um, it, it, it's not because of me, it's, well, I don't know, but the Lottie Han really taught me and the helper work really, has really taught me that the human, the human being is, is willing to be open, uh, given the right environment and, and providing them the absence of space draws out all this stuff. And the questions that I ask every once in a while, I'll be able to, to make a turn of phrase or a question that will just take the conversation. I, I listen to it sometimes. It's really this miraculous thing where we're just bantering we're just having nothing to do about nothing and then it just goes whoosh, it goes deep and quiet and he, and every once in a while i get people to really talk about their their reality or their spiritual experience like their spiritual side of that and being guided by an understanding of the re reality inside of life the life inside of life that the laudion has revealed to me allows me to participate in in revealing life inside of other people's lives Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, the fast, the Ramadan fast. Uh, yeah. Has that had much of an effect on your doing that? Um, I, the first year that I was open in Subud, it was in Chicago, and I decided to try the fast. And it was really, really difficult for me. And I just couldn't wait to eat. You know, I was just obsessed with food. Um, but you know, you, you get through it, you get used to it. And then, uh, and then those nights of power were just super powerful. My first Ramadan, like those nights of the 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th night, I was, I made a mistake. Um, I, it was like the 27th night of, of the fast and a friend was in town and this was in the cold, dark heart of winter in Chicago. It was like, she was on Christmas break from, from college and she wanted to take me to a movie. So we went and saw a movie, um, called last night, which is about the end of the world. Um, it's actually a pretty clever movie. Um, and, and in the middle of the movie, I just started to have a Lottie Han it like just came pouring down and I had to run to the bathroom and just like wait for it to, to subside. And then I went back, we finished the movie and then we got in the car and she was, she was really chattery and she was chatty and chatty and chatty and her brain was just moving a mile a minute. I'm like, well, I need you to, I need you to pull over, pull over right now, pull over right now. She pulled over the car. And then again, like the Lottie on just like went through me and then it went all the way up through her and I know you're not supposed to do that it was really and she just like she started doing Lottie Hunt too she just started like laughing really harsh like I see it I see it I see it I'm like I'm sorry okay we need to stop we need to stop I'm really sorry I shouldn't have shared that with you but it, like it came out of me um, so the, the Ramadan especially those last 10 uh, days that last third of the fast I get something um, it's like, like I said, with work, like I get an understanding, um, if in the very least I get removed from the habits that slow me down, that make me sluggish, I, I get, I get a little bit of respite from the bad parts of myself or the inefficient parts of myself, the, the addictive nature that I have. Um, and there was, I can tell it one, one more story that I think is really important that I want on the record is that I was, um, I was 
in Portland for Ramadan and it was the Ramadan was in summer and I was painting Camille, uh, Hoffendel's house, uh, just the side of her house. And I went, it was lunch break. So I went and I took a walk and I was walking down the street and my grandfather had just died. And, and I was walking back to her house and I can't really describe it with words, but I was going, going, I was moving, I was moving. And then I stopped existing. I just stopped existing. And then I, I was existing again. And, and I just, there's this one step that I took where I ceased to exist. And then I existed again. And then I just knew this knowledge came into me that said, this is what death is like. Death is just a door that all, all death is, was a door is a door. And I had been obsessing over death, uh, for a couple of years at that point, it was really kind of, I had lost my, my ego and my ambition again. And I was really obsessed with death. My grandfather died. I had that experience and I, I began to let death go, you know, cause I, I'd stay up at night. Like what, what happens when I die? I'm going to like lose my, do I taste anymore? Do I hear it? Am I just going to be death? and blind, you know, like I'm going to lose my seeing and my hearing. I'm not gonna be able to do anything. Like, you know, I would just obsess about it and that relieved me. And then that night or the night afterwards, I was laying in my bed and I woke up, you know, like I had one of those Lottie Hunt things where I was just like, I woke up because the room was just, and the wall like opened up and I saw my grandpa and his two wives. Cause my grandpa had a wife who died of cancer and then he remarried and they were all dead. And my grand, my maternal uh, biological grandmother died when my dad was like seven. So it really messed him up. And I felt a lot of the, uh, a lot of my trouble when I was 19 leading up to me being opened, um, was I believe me processing family, family grief over the death of this woman. Um, and that the death uh, of her really, uh, shook up my family and I was processing that like crazy. Um, and Ladion's helped with that. But anyway, so I saw grandpa and his two wives and they were just in another place. I'm like, oh, okay. Like they're, they're not, not, they don't not exist. And then I, and then uh, the next night I had a dream where I was, I was hanging out with my dad and I saw my dad. I'm like, oh, that's why my dad is the way my dad is. And then I saw his dad. I'm like, oh, well, that, okay. So that's, my dad's dad. And then I just started to see all of my fathers and it just like turned into this staircase of fathers. And I just went all the way down. And then there was Adam and he was this huge man with really dark skin and this white beard. And it was just like Adam, the father. And I was so happy. I ran up to him and I like grabbed his arm. It was huge. I'm like, I love you so much, dad. And, and, and somebody's like, why are you treating the prophet Adam like that? I'm like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I just like, I was just, I just was overcome with love for you. Um, I just overcome with love. So, you know, the, the life in Subi, it's, there are those little moments, those little experiences like that. That's not the goal or the aim. It's like kind of like the little chocolate sprinkles on, on top. Of Lion. So I have been blessed with some, some of those things. So what is your overall assessment of being in Subaru? Um, I, well, I'm kind of a remote member and I am a helper, um, but it's all remote. Um, everything's remote now. Um, cause I don't, I'm not, I need to get, um, closer to a group because uh, in-person lighting is really important to me. And I, I miss out on that and it's really not good for me not to have that in my life. Um, and so, uh, I need to, I need to change that, but you know, there's Lottie Han and then there's Subud, the organization and Subud, the organization is, you know, it's worldwide. So there's all these different clades and different cultures in it. And America's going through growing pains right now. America's kind of in this weird spot. The United States is in this weird spot where there's not a lot of people my age or younger in it. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's advancing. Everybody's advancing in age. I, I remember the first time I was a uh, regional helper for Pacific Northwest, I was, you know, tested into the position at Manuka. I can't remember what year. Um, and I was there and I was in the dining hall and I looked at everybody. So I saw all these bald and gray heads and I looked around. And I'm like, this is so weird. And my job, my job in Subud is to shepherd 
is just to help these people in their, you know, help the boomers in their last chapter, you know, and just serve the boomers in their last chapter. And nobody knows what's going to happen next. You know, there's all these like worries and anxieties, you know, and, and Americans are so weird. We're so weird. I've been doing these interviews like you. I met this woman who works in the deep state, who's been in Subud in the deep state. Um, and by which I mean, she's worked in Congress. Like she worked with Nancy Pelosi. She, she worked like right in the heart of power. And it was really interesting having this discussion with her because she was in this, she was looking at the world from this completely different alien view from everybody outside of that little tiny cohort that controls everything in the world. Like these people control the world and they're so divorced from normal people. And so they have these huge outlandish ideas about, you know, you know the fascists are coming for them or whatever, you know. And this woman, it was so interesting because she's really, really on fire for transitioning children uh, to give children sex changes. She, she thinks that it's absolutely essential for people to be able to get that sort of medical care. And I've spent hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours looking into this issue and seeing it as not a good thing. I, I just don't see it as a good thing, but she thinks it's a good thing. And everybody in that point of view in those, in those halls of power thinks that it's really a good thing. And she said something really interesting, how, how she how super culture needs to change, how, how it needs to be more inclusive, but cultures are getting in the way. You know, all these different uh, conservative cultures out there are going to get in the way of that. We need to change the stupid culture, but there's these other cultures out there that are not going to get in the way. And it was this really interesting moment of seeing that, um, that global American government mindset of this universal one world culture, one world government that's extremely efficient, extremely liberal. Everybody gets to be whatever they want. And every culture that wants to be specific or itself needs to get out of the way. And I don't know why I brought that up. Um, but I guess I was, so I was listening to her. I'm like, I am, you were my total enemy, <laughs> but you are, you are a sister in Christ. <laughs> Or, you know, not Christ. You're my Subud sister. It's just this really weird, like you are so different than me. You're a threat to culture, but I, but God loves you. It works through you. And I love you. And, and God works through me and we can just like be close. We can be together and, and different and we can share and the doing the interviews. I've done a lot of interviews um, and just meeting these different old timers in Subud and seeing how the Lottie Han has completely adapted itself to every individual and made them more of an individual. And, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't be talking about the woman uh, who I said uh, is my enemy. She's not my enemy. It's just the, the idea that, that the whole world has to be one thing. It sounds really good on paper and Subud kind of seems to be a globalist movement or, or this movement that, that is for everyone. And, and does that mean that everybody becomes the same and everybody becomes homogenized? That's what the liberal program wants, like the global desire to export American values. I've spoken with people in the deep state where America's tried to export our morality to other places and not really understood the difference in these different cultures and how these different cultures, these different people, they operate different. They have a different, uh, just a different framework of living the world. And when we start to mess with that, it destroys these things. It, it creates havoc in these things. And we, we pretend that we don't have a culture that we are like this modern, uh, culture. We really do think Americans really do think that we are the end all be all of history. Like we were here. We g God gave us a mandate to, to, to protect the world. Right. And it's, it's just so, and, and I can see that Subu has kind of like this universalism to it. That's different. It's fundamentally different. It's, it's fundamentally different than this universalism that's in the head that has this rational conception of the world, this economic, um, this, the Subu universalism, it has room for difference in such a profoundly different way. Like if you, I, I'm, I live in a forest, I'm looking out the forest and I can just see thousands upon thousands of different entities all battling it out. 
And every entity has its own unique personality, and they all come together. They, they, you, you, you have these invas- invasive species that come in and try to homogenize in, in an environment where we're, we're suffering from stink bug infestations now. Like they, they were imported from Asia, and they're just taking over. There's no natural predator. Um, and they're just dominant in this thing. But the, the Subud, the promise of Subud, the promise of the Ladihan, the reality of the Ladihan is that there's a richening and a deepening. And harmony. So Frederick Branchflower, did you get to interview him? He just passed. I was not able to interview Frederick, no. Yeah, me neither. He would go on about how important it is for us to have harmony in, in Subud. And I don't know how to bring harmony to Subud, especially with the older people. Like, they're just so, they have hundreds, you know, decades of bad blood between them and all these quirky personalities, you know, but there's this, there's this promise of us being individuals and, and, and still finding an ability to fit in and to find that harmony. I don't know how to make that happen, but I can see the promise in Subud where you can actually have these different belief systems, these different religions, these people who believe in Islam, who Catholic, Protestant, um, you know, Buddhist, uh, Taoist, all these different worldviews can come together and that 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 individuality and that expression of love of the divine and that that ancient those ancient cultures can all be mixed together without becoming like boiled and homogenized velveta cheese and it's so hard because we want that i think uh, the moderns liberals we want that especially the people on the left and and I'm of the left but I just it's my enemy at this point because it's gone to our heads this uh, des- desire to fix the world and save the world and and this hubris of doing that that's just so dangerous and deadly literally deadly and and yet I I go through these phases of of wrestling with well I want to be universal too I, I want to be univer- I want to be able to fit into every culture and still have my own identity and still have my own culture and be proud of my culture, be proud of what my ancestors have done and 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 see the mistakes and 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 see the process of of those mistakes being purified over time by the love of God, not by not by some sort of outside governmental force, but just by God healing us through time. I have one more point. I don't know why I'm going off on this, so I apologize. This is really weird and political. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. So, did you just say you had one more thing to say? or? Yeah, I guess uh, let's say one more thing. Um, so... So, I guess... The, the worry that is expressed, that has been expressed for 20 years now that I've witnessed from the boomer set about Gen X and about the millennials and Gen Z, uh, that worry is not unwarranted. Like, where are they? Why are they not showing up? Um, what did we do wrong? Uh, you guys put so much work and you just, there's so many people who just dedicated themselves to, to Subud and had just just stuck it out and they're wonderful amazing people and where are those people now where where, where's the great replacement when's that where's the great it's not a replacement where's the great replenishment when is that going to happen and it needs to happen because america is lost without that if you look at the young people right now with the technology that they're given access to with what happened during the lockdowns and how that negatively impacted them and the the amount of of misery the amount of brokenness in the youth today, like how they are just, they are yearning for reality and they're not given it. They're lied to constantly. They're constantly just immersed in lies and fakeness. It's just, it's incredible what they have to face. It's phenomenal. Like the amount of mind fuckery, sorry to use that term going on right now on that generation is beyond anything we've ever seen in history. How are we going to get through that? I think it's, I think that it's possible that only through a, a massive up, uptick in lies that the truth can start to actually be heard. Like where people start to actually yearn from the inside out for truth and Subud, I don't know how it translates as a, as an entity, as an organization, we are holding one spigot to that truth. And in my 
experience, it is the most pure spigot. It's, it's one of the purest, like just trickles and floods and pipelines to the divine. Um, and, and, and it's here for them. And I think that they are, they need it, but they have to, they have to be called. I had to be called. I had to be called. And I think that it's possible that in time that's going to happen. So I think that there's hope going forward. I don't know if, if you, I think your generation in a way, um, the boomer generation is kind of Israel and the, it is, especially in America, you, you guys, you guys came out of Egypt and you had this really long trek and you're just looking for the promised land. You're like, the promised land's almost here, but you just, you're, you're like Moses looking at the promised land and you're like, Oh, I, we want it. We want it. We've wanted it so long, but that, that the amount of work that you guys put in, it's going to, it's going to have an effect. It's going to be there and you might be robbed of, of the, of the, the prize. But I, I think that, I think that it's there. I think that's a pretty good assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows though? Who knows? Yeah. Well, thank you for being willing to share all this. Thank, sure you, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the work you're doing. Um, let me know. Okay, so I'll, I guess we'll end it here. No, I'll okay, why don't we stop the recording right now? Okay, so have a good day. There we go. Boom. Okay.